It's the little toll road that winds through the forested Eiffel Mountains in Germany. It's surrounded by walls on all sides and it's 12.9 miles long. When you get on it, you end up right back where you started. It's one of the most exhilarating and unforgiving roads in the world and they call it the Grüne Halle. You D-holes have been asking for this one forever, so here we go. The first episode of Battle Race Track. This is everything you need to get this is everything you need to know to get up to speed on the Nürburgring. Way back in the early days of motor spurts, there weren't dedicated tracks for people to race their cars on. And in Germany in the early 1920s, drivers would put their racing skills to the test on public roads. But much like roller hockey, car, But much like roller hockey, car. But much like roller hockey, auto racing was found to be too dangerous for traditional public roads. Car! Thanks to a little thing called the Treaty of Versailles. The reparations Germany had to pay for World War I were really steep. And when combined with the massive tariffs by foreign governments, the German economy was more like the eco no money. One government official by the name of Dr. Otto Cruz was like, we got no safe place to race. We got no jobs and I'm tired all the time. Then he had a glue clump a moment. We will build the... It's a mailman. <laughs> we will build the longest motorsport racetrack in the world and we'll make it an unemployment relief project thus giving our economy a boost while also providing a place to showcase superfly German auto engineering, yeah? Track development started in the fall of 1925 with Gustav Eichler as the lead architect. With the help of over 25,000 workers and 40 million Reich marks, which is the equivalent to $146 million in today's folding money, they were able to complete the circuit by spring of 1927. When all was said and done, the Nürburgring was 17.6 miles long, comprised of three loops and featured 174 turns with about a thousand feet of elevation changes. There was the South Loop, AKA Schuschleife, which was about 4.8 miles long. Then there was the 14.2 mile North Loop, AKA Nordschleife. And there was a little start stop loop, also known as Zielscheife, which helped join the two major loops together. And the best part of the whole thing is that the track was also a toll road, which meant anyone could drive it. The Eiffel Race christened the track in June of 1927. 85,000 spectators gathered for the two days of racing, which featured 100 motorcycles on Saturday and 65 race cars on Sunday. Rudolf Caracciola won the first auto race and also became the first ringmeister, which because I'm almost fluent in German, I can tell you means ringmaster. I'm also a bit of a ringmaster. Sparkly, luxurious, decadent. The first German Grand Prix was hosted about a month later and drivers from all over Europe were blown away by the immense length and poo your pants challenges of the circuit. After only three GGPs on the full course, they decided to race just the North Loop and leave the South Loop to motorcycles and smaller races. The Great Depression effed up the early 30s with the Grand Prix being canceled in both 31 and 33. But in 1934, the race was on and a legend was born. <laughs> That year, race officials had put a cap on the car weight of 750 kilograms, but Mercedes didn't get the memo. So they showed up with the car weighing 751 kilograms. The crew scraped off the lead-based paint, revealing the silver aluminum body. The Mercedes W25 went on to win the race and was nicknamed the Silver Arrow. This day, Mercedes still uses a silver motif on their livery. Unfortunately, just as things were heating up at the ring, Dub Dub 2 happened because bad guys were doing bad things and had to be stopped. So, racing resumed in 1947 and in 1951, Formula One joined the party. What started off as a great marriage between track and racing body quickly turned into a nightmare as the cars got faster and faster. In a 15 year period from 54 to 69, five F1 drivers died at the ring. 
It also led to Sir Jackie Stewart naming it Green Hell after he won in the 1968 German Grand Prix. By the 70s, the F1 cars were just too freaking fast for the track. Between the steep elevation changes, jumps, bumps, blind corners, and almost complete lack of runoff areas, the circuit was a recipe for disaster. In 1971, F1 drivers refused to race there until the track was made safe. The bumps and jumps were smoothed out. The occasional corner was added to keep speeds down, and of course, some safety barriers were installed. Despite the changes, a fiery accident in 1976 almost killed F1 championship leader and legend Nicky Lauda. After Nicky's wreck, Formula One quit racing there altogether. After losing the Formula One series, the ring built a more traditional 2.8 mile Grand Prix circuit known as GP Strecke. It was way freaking safer and only featured 12 turns, which was quite the downgrade from the Nordschleife 73. The first race held on the new track was in 1984, and a young Brazilian by the name of Ayrton Senna, you ever heard of him? He freaking won. He was driving a Benz. He went on to win his first F1 race just a year later at the Portuguese Grand Prix. Portuguese Grand Prix. Portuguese Grand Prix. Portuguese. With the new track came the return of F1, but all was not well for the ring. They were going broke. F1 president Bernie Ecclestone was charging so much to license Formula One events that lots of tracks were losing money. So to generate revenue, the track charged spectators more for tickets and spectators were like, no, they'll just watch it on TV. While F1 was a financial strain, other series helped generate some revenue. There was the 24 hours of Nürburgring, which started in 1970 as part of the VLN series. There was, of course, the DTM, or German Touring Car Series. And in 1986, the ring hosted the first ever Truck Grand Prix, which is still one of the track's biggest annual events in more ways than one. Get it? Trucks. They're big. But still, the ring was having trouble staying out of the red. That is until the German auto industry stepped in. See, starting in the late 60s, consumers wanted sportier cars and manufacturers were churning them out. But manufacturers needed a proper testing ground for development and research, and the ring offered every type of driving condition in one beautiful little package. Up until the 80s, only a few manufacturers used the track as a test facility. The M Sport division of BMW started testing there in 1972, but for the most part, the track sat vacant. Not to be outdone by the ultimate driving machine, other German manufacturers built research facilities next to the track. And since cars break often when driven on the edge, parts manufacturers moved into the area to supply the engineers. That's how Nürburgring became one of the dopest car towns on the planet. By the start of the 90s, the track was packed with test mules. To help keep the track safe, management set aside 16 weeks of track time exclusively for industrial testing. By the mid 2000s, manufacturers, media, and consumers became obsessed with the ring. I'm obsessed with the ring. You might be too. Even traditional land yacht brands like Cadillac were testing and developing new sedans and coupes there. The 2009 Nissan GTR's successful re-emergence was almost entirely predicted on its 7 minute 28 second lap around the track, which at the time was faster than any other mass produced vehicle ever. Since then, almost every new sporty car sold advertises its lap time around the ring. In fact, the 2020 Road and Track Performance Car of the Year was a Hyundai Veloster that was almost exclusively designed and honed at Nürburgring. With all these cars testing at the track, manufacturers needed drivers, and one of the most notable drivers is Sabine Schmitz, also known the queen of the ring. Sabine claims to have driven over 20,000 laps on Nordschleife, and it shows she won the 24 hours of Nürburgring in 96 and 97, as well as the VLN championship in 98. That was a good three years for a very exciting time. <laughs> Sabine, along with other high-performance drivers, actually offer taxi services for those willing to fork over some dough to experience the full-speed sweeping turns and crazy G-forces of Fox Soul, or the technically complex Bergwerk Corner, or the <laughs> your pants, throw up in your shirt, piss in your shoes, jump at Flaffengarten 2. 
I just want to apologize to my German speaking audience out there. Uh, I'm doing my best. No disrespect. <laughs> <laughs> but let's say you're more of a hands on kind of person and you want to take your own car around a track. Well, luckily, that can be arranged for $35, depending on the day and week. You can drive the Nordschleife as part of Touristenfahrten, which means public driving in German. Not only are you liable for damages to the track, there's also towing and ambulance fees and lost track time due to stoppage, which can be almost $2,000 an hour. Say you can't bring your car because it doesn't fit under the seat or in front of you or in the overhead bin. You can still enjoy Touristenfahrten by renting a track car. The cars come with roll cages. Sticky little tires, and for a few euros more, you can even hire a navigator. Plus, you can buy expensive insurance packages that help you avoid even more expensive repairs when your rented Renault Clio goes flying off the track at Quiddlebacher Hoha. Trying. Another little bit of advice, if you want to drive the ring, you better do it sooner than later. Many racetracks are suffering financially, but due to its size, this track is especially hurting. In 2012, the track went bankrupt because they built a bunch of tourist attractions and then the tourist number really didn't increase. Then the engineering firm Capricorn Group bought the place for 173 million bones, but since they're all Capricorns, they couldn't make up their freaking minds. So Russian billionaire Viktor Karatonin bought the majority ownership of the track in 2014. So now you know a little bit more about the Nuremberg Ring, and maybe, just maybe, if you're a good person and do good things, you will someday find yourself burning rubber in the Grüne Hula. We have a second channel. It's called Donut Podcast. We are so, so stoked about this. It's my favorite thing to do. Our first podcast is called Past Gas, where me and the boys dig deep in the craziest stories and people in automotive history. Uh, check it out at Donut Podcast or stream it anywhere you stream podcasts.